This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. So most of you are probably uh, not that familiar with the placenta, so I'll just give a very brief introduction. Uh, the uh, placenta is a transient organ, uh, and it's only um, part of us during intrauterine life, but I'd like to say that really none of us would be here uh, without it, and it really plays a uh, pivotal role uh, for fetal growth and development uh, in utero. So the placenta is uh, on the one side attached to mom, it's attached to the, uh, the uterus, and on the other side it's attached uh, through the umbilical cord uh, to the baby. And it really serves multiple functions during pregnancy, but probably its most important function is to provide oxygen and nutrients to the growing fetus. So here, I'd like to um, just say a brief word about what I do clinically. Um, people ask me when they hear that I work on the placenta if I'm an obstetrician, and I'm not. I'm a perinatal pathologist, and uh, you may not have uh, heard of that, but basically what that means is that what one of the things that I do is uh, when the obstetrician uh, sees a complication with pregnancy, they send me the placenta to examine after delivery. And I examine this placenta both grossly and microscopically, and based on this examination, can tell them most often the cause of the complication, be it bleeding, infection, or something as bad as stillbirth. So one of the main reasons, one of the common reasons that an obstetrician would send us a placenta to examine is uh, preeclampsia. So preeclampsia pre is a maternal syndrome that develops during the second half of pregnancy. And it's sometimes called the silent killer because a lot of its symptoms are in fact silent. The two um, uh, most common symptoms of preeclampsia are high blood pressure, um, which uh, denotes vascular problems with mom, and protein in the urine which means that there is kidney dysfunction. Now, there's uh, several variants to preeclampsia. Um, uh, one is uh, gestational hypertension. That's when uh, the um, high blood pressure exists by itself. Uh, there's eclampsia, which means that on top of the high blood pressure and proteinuria, mom develops um, uh, seizures. There is HELP syndrome, um, which is, again, on top of these syndromes when mom develops uh, liver dysfunction or low uh, platelets, which means that then she can't clot and she will bleed very easily. So all of these uh, constellation of disorders, um, they complicate 5 to 8% of all pregnancies worldwide. And as you can imagine, they cause uh, multiple maternal and neonatal um, complications. So in fact, preeclampsia is the leading cause of maternal uh, mortality in the developed world. It's also the leading cause of fetal growth restriction, or IUGR, um, which is a bad complication in uh, the fetus. And there's no cure for any of these diseases except to deliver the baby. So in fact, preeclampsia is the number one cause of induced preterm delivery in the US. So um, as you might know, babies that are uh, born uh, preterm, and particularly those that are born uh, gr as uh, growth-restricted babies, um, they have significant um, uh, complications, and they uh, will end up having to spend uh, a good amount of their neonatal life, sometimes months, in the neonatal intensive care unit. And this costs approximately $3,500 per day, but it has a bigger cost medically because these babies actually develop so many complications. They can have intestinal problems because they have to be uh, fed uh, through tubes. They can have uh, bleeding in their brain. They can develop what's called retinopathy of prematurity, which can cause them to go blind. And um, uh, so, uh, in fact, uh, there, there are multiple complications they go through, and even um, if they, uh, when they survive their um, a neonatal period, uh, when they're adults, they have an increased risk of developing metabolic syndrome and cardiovascular disease. So it's a complication that basically keeps on uh, uh, leading to uh, further complications in adult life. And all of this is because they just had a bad placenta. So. 
what do we know about placental development? Actually, in fact, we don't know that much, especially in humans, about how the placenta develops, particularly early on. We do know, so if you look at this um, picture of an embryo here, you can see that um, basically the um, fetus develops from these group of cells that are on the inside of the embryo, and the placenta develops from this outer layer of cells, and these cells are called trophoblasts. So trophoblasts come from uh, the Greek word meaning to feed. And in fact, that's what the job of these cells uh, is. These cells set out to first um, establish blood flow uh, from mom to the placenta and then to provide um, uh, oxygen and nutrients to the baby. So they start out as stem cells in the placenta, trophoblast stem cells, and they have to differentiate further into functional um, types of trophoblast. And one of these is the invasive trophoblast. This is the cell type that uh, is um, able to invade the uterus and access maternal blood. And another one is the syncytiotrophoblast, and this is the cell type that is involved with um, oxygen and nutrient exchange. So let's talk a little bit more about uh, these two types of trophoblasts. So the invasive trophoblasts develop early in pregnancy, and they're perhaps the most crucial to pregnancy success. So if these cells don't develop properly, miscarriage happens, stillbirth happens, and complications um, like preeclampsia happen. So before pregnancy, um, mom has these uh, small vessels in the uterus that really can't carry very much blood. So in fact, what these invasive trophoblasts do um, they invade the uterus, they remodel these maternal vessels, and they allow for these vessels to carry lots and lots of blood to the growing placenta and therefore to the fetus. The syncytiotrophoblasts, they develop in these functional units in the placenta called chorionic villi. And these, have, uh, these units have fetal blood vessels in the center, and they're lined by two layers of uh, trophoblast cells. The inner layer is the stem cell, and the outer layer is the syncytiotrophoblast. So these stem cells fuse to form these syncytiotrophoblasts, which then secrete the pregnancy hormone HCG. And because they're in contact, in direct contact with maternal blood, they are able to act uh, to exchange oxygen and nutrients. So uh, when I receive a preeclamptic uh, placenta from an obstetrician, I usually find three problems with these placentas. Right away, the placental disc is small. So very much like the babies are small, the placental disc actually uh, weighs very little. It weighs less than 10th percentile for what it should at that gestational age. Um, then when we cut the placenta and examine the maternal surface, what we find is that there is actually very few invasive trophoblasts. So instead, these maternal vessels are thickened and they're damaged. And then when we examine the chorionic villi, we actually find that these villi have prematurely aged. That means that they have lost their stem cells, and they actually have a high number of these syncytiotrophoblasts, which are shown in brown over here. So in fact, from a trophoblast differentiation perspective, preeclampsia is a disease that has poor formation um, of, uh, or function of the invasive trophoblast. And it shows accelerated differentiation into syncytial trophoblast. So it's a disease where these trophoblast stem cells prematurely age. And in fact, these syncytial trophoblasts, because of lack of oxygen, uh, they prematurely um, age and are not able to do their function. So how can we model this disease in order to be able to um, find a cure for it or find a way to prevent it? So researchers have tried mouse models, but in fact this disease is specific to higher primates. We can also study the placenta at delivery, but at that point we're only seeing the end stage of disease. And in fact, when we look at that delivered placenta, we can't study the invasive trophoblast because most of those cells are left behind in the uterus. So this begs the question, can we use pluripotent stem cells to model placental development? Can these cells differentiate into these placental cells or trophoblasts? 
So when we started working with embryonic stem cells over five years ago, um, there was a huge controversy in this field as to whether these pluripotent stem cells in fact can become trophoblasts. Since then, and thanks very much to CIRM funding, we've been able to confirm, not only confirm that these cells do differentiate into trophoblasts, but that in fact this process happens uh, through a stepwise uh, process. So in fact we can first um, get trophoblast stem cells differentiated in the dish, and uh, subsequently these cells will differentiate further into the invasive trophoblast and the syncytiotrophoblast. And we've also been able to find a mechanism um, for how this process occurs um, in culture. Uh, and finally, we've been able to find um, a defined uh, culture condition for this stepwise differentiation. So the next question after this, though, is that can we in fact model a trophoblast defect in culture? So for this, we actually turn to trisomy 21. Trisomy 21, most of you might know as Down syndrome. And you might also know that Down syndrome uh, patients have complications uh, with their heart. They have neurologic abnormalities. But what you may not know is that um, babies that are born with trisomy 21, they also have defects with their placenta. And in fact, the higher rate of miscarriage with trisomy 21 pregnancies is due to these placental abnormalities. In fact, what pe researchers have found is that the trisomy 21 placentas have a specific defect where they can't form syncytiotrophoblast. So we asked, what if we take trisomy 21 iPS cells and differentiate them and, um, can, and, and ask, are, are they able to differentiate into syncytiotrophoblast? And in fact, we found that the fusion index of these trisomy 21 iPS cells is much less when you compare to a normal karyotype iPS uh, cell. And these trisomy 21 iPS cells also um, retain their trophoblast stem cell markers longer, and they show a delay in secretion of the pregnancy hormone HCG. So all of this basically provided proof of concept to us that we can, in fact, model a trophoblast defect in culture using uh, iPS cells. So now going forward, and again, thanks to CIRM funding, um, we now have a project underway to model the invasive trophoblast defect of preeclampsia using iPS cells. We are recruiting patients in the labor and delivery unit at UCSD, consenting these patients for sampling their placentas. And from these placentas, we um, isolate amnion cells. This is a layer of cells that is on the fetal surface of the placenta. And um, what we plan to do, we're banking these cells, and we plan to um, generate iPS cells um, from these amnion cells. And once we have those iPS cells, we can ask what is their potential to differentiate into these trophoblast subtypes. And we hypothesize that they are going to show a defect in either differentiation or function of these invasive trophoblasts. And um, once we have that, we can actually use these cells um, in, in order to um, screen for drugs that promote differentiation into this lineage and hopefully be able to either prevent or treat preeclampsia. So in order to do this, we have put together a strong interdisciplinary team of clinicians and scientists, and these include Dr. Louise Laurent, who is a high-risk obstetrician and a stem cell researcher at UCSD. We work very closely together to consent these patients and to generate um, iPS cells. And also Dr. Robert Oshima, who is from Sanford Burnham uh, Institute for Medical Research, and he is an expert in the area um, of uh, drug screening and uh, high-throughput assays. So we also have a very uh, large group of researchers that are working on this, and I'm very thankful to all of them, and also very thankful for our funding, uh, particularly to CIRM, who has really provided support for us for, for this project from the very beginning. And so now what I would like to do is introduce you to the parents of uh, this little girl over here, Mia, who is a survivor of uh, preeclampsia along with her mom. Um, her dad, Matteo, in fact, is, um, on our, is part of our research team. Uh, Matteo uh, joined our team, uh, in fact, uh, a little while, um, uh, sh shortly after he joined our team, his wife was diagnosed with uh, preeclampsia. And so now Sylvia and Matteo are going to tell you their experience with preeclampsia. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 
Hello, I'm uh, the proud man of Mia, the girl in the picture. She's now three years old and uh, she was born prematurely at 29 weeks at UCSD. And uh, um, she's doing very well now. She's still followed by specialists because premature babies uh, are at risk for uh, developmental delays and physical delays. She has some delays, but we're hoping she will catch up um, mild delays with speech. Um, I'm here to tell you my story um, as a patient of preeclampsia and as a mom of a premature baby. It's uh, really hard. My pregnancy, I was thinking, was going well. Um, I knew that the Mia uh, was a little bit smaller than average, uh, but what, that was pretty much it. Um, but at a doctor's appointment, um, it was found out that I had a high blood pressure and proteinuria, and I was rushed uh, to the hospital, and the baby was delivered 48 hours um, later because uh, um, they there's really nothing to do other than delivering the baby. Uh, they only waited 48 hours in order for the steroids to have an effect and hopefully uh, help with the lung development. So I cannot tell you how hard it is um, to be in that situation and you know see um, the babies being so small. Mia weighed um, two pounds and eight ounces, and it turned out that she was actually growth restricted, but we didn't know. Uh, she spent the first uh, two and a half months uh, in the neonatal intensive care unit. Um, I knew about all the risks, um, and it was really hard, but in the end, we were lucky. Uh, she had some issues with the lungs. Um, she was diagnosed with chronic lung disease. That means that she needed oxygen for a longer period of time compared to um, other premature babies, but she was able to come home without the oxygen support, and um, she doesn't have any issues uh, anymore with the lungs. Um, so I'm uh, very grateful for your support to preeclampsia research. Uh, grateful to CIRM. Um, I think this disease is not um, very well studied, and that's maybe the reason why so little is known about it, the causes and how to diagnose it early and treat it. And so uh, I'm really hoping that with uh, more research and finding the right models to do drug screening and you know find a way um, to help moms who are in, in that situation. Um, I'm, you know, as I say, thank you very much for your time and for your support. And, you know, I really hope that there can be progress in this disease, a better understanding and um, possibly a cure. And this is my husband, who's also a um, scientist, so that was a very, you know, a coincidence. We were really not expecting that. Yeah, like Mana and my wife just said, uh, my name is Matteo and, and I'm Mia's father. And I'm also like a scientist working on, on placenta related diseases. So, you know, how life has its own turns and twists. And so basically I consider myself extremely lucky. So for two reasons. Uh, the reason number one is that, you know, like Mia's story ended up really well, so that is great. And the second reason is because um, I'm part of a team that can make a difference. So I'm part of a team that can really make things happen. And, but you know, to make these things happen, obviously, uh, uh, we need your support, and uh, you know we have already received some general support and help from you guys. And so you know I'm just here to again, like uh, like uh, uh, my wife just said, to say like thank you for your past and hopefully for your future uh, support. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much for the presentation, and thank you for coming to tell us your story. We appreciate that very much. Uh, are there any questions from members of the board? Dr. Lubin. I'm a pediatrician, and I thought that was a great presentation. Thank you very much for telling us and showing beautiful pictures of your child. But I was looking up on NIH about preterm labor and birth, and I just wanted the board to appreciate that preterm birth is the most common cause of infant death and is the leading cause of long-term disability related to the nervous system in children. 
So the impact of the understanding this and dealing with this has enormous, has enormous benefit to society worldwide. And if you look outside of the United States, it's even a bigger issue than it is here in California. So thank you for that work. And thank you very much for coming and talking to us. Thank you, Dr. Lubin. Any other comments? <coughs> Okay, well, thanks very much again. We appreciated that most interesting presentation. Thank you.